So memories are mass storage devices. So far we have looked at two kinds of storage devices, latches, which are level sensitive storage devices and registers, which are used way more often and they are edge sensitive storage devices. The only way we have to store a lot of data so far is to store them in register files, but this is a very area uneconomic and very power uneconomic. So when you actually need to store a lot of data, and uh, you need a memory. So memories are just simply defined as mass storage devices. They are also array structures, and we will see um, what that means specifically in the upcoming video. But so far, just know that they are arrays of identical elements that are repeated um, a lot of times. And memories have two main concerns. The first is density, and the second is speed. And you might think that this is just, you know, normal, like you would want high density and high speed in random logic. But the fact of the matter is density matters a lot more for memories than it does for data path or for random logic. Because for random logic, the um, cost of silicon area is generally small and has been, has, has been uh, you know, the trend has been for uh, silicon area to be cheaper and cheaper. But for memories, we want to cram as much storage as possible in a small area, and therefore density matters a lot. So why are memories important? Why, why do we want to have mass storage? And why do we care about the speed of memories? Um, to understand this, think about two architectures, two possible uh, architectures that you could have, a processor architecture and a data path architecture. So in processors, it's, it's really um, easy to guess why memories are needed, because processors are divided into a memory, an ALU, and some form of controller. And there's a lot of data moving between the memory and the ALU in both directions, and this is controlled mainly by the controller. So you can imagine that there's a lot of data going to the memory and coming back from it uh, to the ALU. And the same also applies for data path architectures uh, that we have looked at. The data path controller architecture is not that different from a microprocessor architecture. So in a data path architecture, we have uh, a data path consisting of processing units that are, um, that are uh, designed using random uh, CMOS logic. And we have a controller that is usually designed using a state machine and um, you know, the way we described data path and controllers in module nine, we don't actually have uh, any space to use memories here. We don't actually need to use memories. Data goes into the data path and comes out of it the other side, and there's no clear space or need for uh, memories here. But to understand why memories play a role, we have to understand something called time sharing. And time sharing is a, um, it's not an issue exactly, but it's a, uh, um, you know, a, um, a phenomenon that we have to deal with because processing units are becoming very fast. In fact, they are faster than we need to. So let's just imagine that you have an operation uh, which consists of, let's say, um, 10 additions. And I'm just going to use an adder as an example here. So we have um, 10 additions that happen in parallel, right? And um, for some reason, the uh, adder is much faster than the throughput we need from uh, this operation. So let's assume that the adders work at 200 megahertz, and we just need the output to come at a rate of 100 mega samples per second. So that means that these processing units are producing outputs twice as fast as we need these outputs. We could possibly underclock uh, all 10 uh, processing units and get the, uh, get the uh, uh, throughput that we need, but we could also do something different. We could actually use only five processing units. And of course, this discussion applies to uh, any processing unit and to any ratio between the needed output and the processing unit operating frequency. So we could actually use only five adders instead of 10 adders. And now each adder accepts two inputs. So in one cycle, 
we are going to provide the inputs for the uh, first five adders. In the second cycle, we'll provide the inputs for uh, the uh, other five adders. And uh, this is going to produce an effective output at 100 mega samples per second because it can perform additions at 200 mega samples per second. Now, the problem with time sharing is that at some point, you're going to have a lot of intermediate data to store. So if the operations are not being done in parallel like this, if they're being done sequentially one after the other, then you will need somewhere to store intermediate data so that you can read it in the next cycle. So what I'm talking about here is that a certain processing unit is um, operating and it's getting its operands from somewhere and it's producing an output and that output itself will become one of its operands in the next cycle. So we need to store it somewhere and the immediate uh, instinct is to store it in a register. But if you imagine that you have many of these processing units and many parallel inputs and probably many parallel outputs, then this becomes a task that needs a mass storage device, specifically a memory. So we need a memory in this case. And the problem with the digital design is always how to figure how many memory banks we need, um, because memories um, tend to be faster than processing units. So they can provide inputs and outputs multiple times per each processing unit cycle. But sometimes that's not even enough and you need to divide the memories uh, into multiple banks. And so memories and their bandwidth are actually significantly important. I would say even more important than the uh, frequency of operation of random logic. And you need to pay a lot of attention, not only to the amount of data that you can store in the memory, but to how fast you can read and potentially write this data. Now, we are going to discuss a number of memory arrays. Uh, we're going to discuss ROMs, which are read-only memories. And when we say ROM, we basically mean a um, uh, for real ROM, a, a memory that could only be written a single time and no more than a single time. And there are two types of uh, ROMs that we will discuss, NOR ROMs and NAND ROMs. And it will be immediately obvious why we call them NOR and NAND ROMs, because they form NOR and NAND dynamic logic gates uh, in the memory columns. The second kind of memory we will discuss is non-volatile memories, and that's a large category of memories. Non-volatile memories are memories whose contents are going to stay there whether there's a power supply or not. But they are also rewritable in a way. We call it programmability. So they're not writable, um, they're not easily rewritable, but they are rewritable. And NVMs, specifically two types of NV NVMs that we will discuss in detail, NAND flash and NOR flash, are extremely important because they form the majority of mass storage devices that we have available. Mass storage devices on on uh, electronic platforms are used to store um, documents and programs and everything that is not immediately needed. And um, you might know it by the name hard disk, but hard disks are magnetic memories that use uh, moving parts and mechanical processes to read and write, and they are not suitable for modern mobile platforms. And so we need uh, solid state memories that can be written and read perhaps not as fast as other types of memories, but that can keep data when the power is turned off. And these are non-volatile memories. Now, the third kind of memory we will uh, discuss is uh, RAM. And specifically, we will discuss SRAM and DRAM. And we will distinguish between the two, even though you know, they are kind of related, because the um, structure of, of these two memories is completely different and their behaviors are completely different. The only thing that, that, that they have in common is that they are both readable and writable. And so um, these are the memories that form the main memories of, processor, of processors and also most of the embedded memories in, uh, in ASICs. Now, memories are usually classified based on a number of, uh, of metrics uh, or, or uh, parameters. For example, we can discuss memories in terms of their volatility. And volatility means um, 
if we remove the power supply, is the memory going to keep its contents or are the contents going to evaporate when we power back on? And ROMs in general are non-volatile, but they are also non-writable, so that's not very useful. Non-volatile memories, you can tell from the name, are non-volatile. RAMs are volatile, so if you remove the power supply, definitely you're going to lose the stored value. There's a small chance that a DRAM or an SRAM might keep some of the values on some of the nodes, but you can never rely on that. So another way we can um, classify memories is based on their writability. So are they uh, writable or are they read-only? And for read-only memories, we can, um, we can actually see from the name that it's just read-only. Uh, RAMs in general are uh, writable. So SRAM and DRAM are easily writable. SRAM is more so than DRAM. Non-volatile memories are kind of... Um, they're kind of iffy because you can actually write them, write to them, but writing to non-volatile memories is a lot more involved than writing to RAMs. So we can't really call it writing, and instead we call it programming. Uh, the, the other way we can classify memories is based on storage mechanism. So in storage mechanism, we're talking about whether storage is in dynamic nodes, and in module 5, we... Um, we explored what a dynamic node is. It just means storing on a capacitor, which sees open circuits in all directions, or whether the storage mechanism is static, which from module six is based on positive feedback and pairs of inverters. So um, SRAM is static. You can actually see it from the name. S is for static. Dynamic RAM is dynamic, and the storage takes place on a capacitive node. Non-volatile memories and ROMs, we can say that their the storage is static because they don't actually store on a uh, capacitive node. Even though they don't actually store in a positive feedback loop, they store or do not store based on the presence of, of or lack thereof a transistor. But since it's not dynamic, we're just going to say that it is uh, static. The other thing we can talk about is um, the reading mechanism. So... When we look at, um, at all of these memories, we will find that we actually use dynamic reading for all of the memories, which means that the memories form dynamic gates along the columns. And this will become clear only when we discuss specific memory arrays. But we should be aware that there's a distinction between whether the storage is static or dynamic and how reading takes place. So reading could be done dynamically, but that doesn't change the fact that the array is still storing data uh, statically. The last thing, and it's really important, is whether this memory can be embedded in, uh, in an ASIC or not, which means can it be integrated with random logic created using a standard CMOS process or not. So some of these memories can be created uh, using standard CMOS. Some of them we will see clearly either in the cross-section of devices or in the layout they need weird things to happen in order for them to be uh, implemented in the first place or be implemented efficiently. So that makes a huge difference for us because memories that can be embedded can be used as embedded memory or cache or online memory within the same ASIC. Memories that cannot be embedded either will need a very difficult process that involves non-standard CMOS combined with standard CMOS or will be off-chip memory. So ROMs in general, uh, when we look at the layouts, it might not seem that they need non-standard CMOS, but they actually kind of do. So, you know, whether, whereas you can embed them, effective ROMs are very difficult to embed. NVMs, on the other hand, are clearly not suitable for embedding with a standard CMOS process. They need special devices that are not available to a standard process. The same applies for DRAM. There are variants of DRAM that can be uh, implemented uh, using standard CMOS, but they are often very inefficient and, um, you know, there's no point to using them. So efficient DRAMs need special processing and are often, most often, used as off-chip main memories in microprocessors. So that leaves SRAM, and SRAM is actually 
uh, really easy to embed. Uh, it can be implemented using standard CMOS. There's nothing weird about it. And it is what we mean when we say memories, when we design digital circuits. So if you say memory and you don't qualify it, you actually mean either an SRAM or sometimes a ROM. The disadvantage, the price that you pay is that SRAMs are huge. So a single cell in an SRAM is bigger than a single cell in any of the other memory types.